Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise in adjournment proceedings this evening to return to a question that I originally asked on February 1st. Uh, this House will recall, because we spent today working on the subject of electoral reform, that it was on February 1st that the uh, Prime Minister changed the mandate letter to the Honourable Minister for Democratic Institutions. And I put to the Prime Minister this question. Within 18 months of forming government, we will introduce legislation to enact electoral reform. Close quote. That is from the Liberal platform. It is very clear. And it was repeated with clarity in the speech from the throne. And the mandate to us as members of the special committee said we were replacing first past the post. I went on to ask the Prime Minister if it was an essential precondition to follow this promise that there be some sort of nationally proven majority, that there be some consensus discerned through vague surveys. Why was that never mentioned in any promise or any mandate? I was honoured that the Prime Minister stood to respond to my question personally, and he replied that uh, anything a Prime Minister or a government must do must be in the interest of Canada and all Canadians particularly when it comes to transforming our electoral system. I understand the passion and intensity with which the member opposite believes in this, and many Canadians mirror that passion and intensity, but there is no consensus. Well, uh, I could go on with the answer, but as you can see, it missed the fundamental point of my question was, if there was going to be a precondition, a condition precedent, before the Liberal government kept its promise, why was that never mentioned? I contrast that with other promises in the Liberal platform, promises that I'm glad were kept, frankly. It was a promise to bring in a national carbon price. They're on their way to doing that. They had a long process involving the various provinces to have a nationally uh, prepared, ar the architecture of it allows for every province to have the money come back to it if it doesn't, in fact, put forward its own carbon pricing mechanism. It allows for cap and trade in Ontario and Quebec, a carbon tax in BC. But if you'll catch my drift, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you'll see that that was an election promise. There was no attempt to go back and find out if there was a broad consensus within Canada for one particular form of carbon pricing. There are many different kinds. There's cap and trade. There's straight up carbon tax, there's carbon fee and dividend, there's revenue neutral carbon taxes, and there are adherents to all of those systems. And there are those, as we know, in this House, who don't want any carbon pricing at all. I don't know that you could say there was a clear path forward for a particular form of carbon pricing. But I'm very glad the government of the day did what it promised to do in its platform and bring forward some form of carbon pricing. I put to you, Mr. Speaker, that that's exactly what the Liberals should do about their promise on electoral reform. It did betray that promise to withdraw it on February 1st. But having spent today, and this is just a coincidence that my adjournment proceedings question came up on a day that we've been debating all day long this promise, I'm of the view that the Liberals, in making that promise, intended to keep it. And that if they were to see a clear path forward, more particularly if the Prime Minister were to see a clear path forward, through the work of all of us in a nonpartisan fashion, many of us who were on that electoral reform committee, as well as from the efforts of those in the Liberal backbenches who were lamenting a decision to break a promise, no doubt they're hearing from their angry constituents, it's not too late. So in the course of this debate over the next, I think, remaining six minutes or so that we have, I'd like to ask the Parliamentary Secretary response to help me, with goodwill and setting aside partisanship, figure out how the promise can still be kept. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Democratic Institutions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to the member opposite for, for the question um, earlier in the month. Our government believes that electoral reform, indeed all democratic reform, should be about pursuing the broad, most broad possible public interest. And we believe and we continue to believe that potential reforms must be judged by how they will help Canadians. This is why the Prime Minister has said we're not prepared to move forward with something so fundamental as reforming our electoral system without the broad support of Canadians. 
Listening to Canadians is absolutely fundamental to our role as parliamentarians, and this is why the government initiated a national consultation process on electoral reform last spring. First, we asked an all -party special a special all-party committee of the House of Commons to study the issue, and the special committee consulted broadly with relevant experts and organizations and conducted a national engagement process that included traveling to every province and every territory, hearing from 196 experts, 567 open mic participants, receiving 574 written submissions and more than 22,000 responses to their e-consultation survey. We also asked MPs to hold their own town halls to hear the views of their constituents, and MPs held 170 such town halls. The government held public meetings in every province and every territory to hear directly from Canadians. And we sought to ensure that every Canadian could have their view heard through an innovative online engagement and educational tool that asked Canadians what values and what principles they wanted to see reflected in their voting system. More than 360,000 people in Canada took the time to participate and have their views heard in this important initiative, and I urge all of my fellow MPs to read the report. As the Minister of Democratic Institutions has noted, it's clear that all of these important efforts to listen to Canadians, despite them, the broad consensus needed for change of this magnitude simply does not exist. The government respects and is thankful for all those Canadians who came forward and took the time to share their thoughts about our democracy and have their voices heard. But when you hold public consultation, you have to be ready to listen to what you hear. And we listened to what we heard. Mr. Speaker, this of course does not put an end to the important work our government is doing to strengthen our elections and build confidence in our democratic institutions. And I'd like to highlight three of government's pro uh, priorities moving ahead. First, we'll be continuing to move forward with Bill C-33 to make it easier for eligible voters to participate in elections, as well as to improve electoral integrity. Second, the Minister will be working with her colleagues, the Minister of National Defence and the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, to help protect our voting system from the threat of hacking. And third, notwithstanding that Canada already has one of the best regulated political finance regimes in the world, we will take steps to make fundraising even more open and even more transparent. Mr. Speaker, these are only a few of the items in the mandate letter of the Democratic Minister of Democratic Institutions. Our hardworking colleagues on the Procedure and House Affairs Committee are also doing important work to review the Chief Electoral Officer's recommendations for improving the electoral process. Clearly, there is still much work to do to further enhance our electoral process, and I look forward to supporting these efforts to reinforce Canada's strong democratic foundations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm, uh, I thank my honourable friend and colleague, the Parliamentary Secretary. I agree that if a government engages in a consultation, it should listen to what it heard. What it heard was overwhelming support for proportional representation. More than 80 percent of the witnesses who testified before the committee, members of the public in the tens of thousands who answered surveys online that our committee put forward. And bear in mind, the mandate of our committee was not to hold a consultation and tell the government if there was consensus, because the promise had been made. The promise was we're getting rid of first past the post. The committee was asked, what do you recommend instead? But we also listened to Canadians. We listened to them by the tens of thousands, even the mydemocracy.ca survey overwhelmingly reflected values consistent with proportional representation and not with our current broken, archaic and perverse first-past-the-post. It's not too late for the Liberal government to listen to Canadians. Those with an opinion overwhelmingly want to have fair voting. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The platform included many elements of electoral reform and it certainly also included engaging with Canadians to make such important uh, decisions. And Mr. Speaker, engaging as many Canadians as possible in the conversation around electoral reform is something that we have taken very seriously, as I've just uh, enumerated. It was what Canadians expected us to do before embarking on fundamental change to our democracy. Listening to Canadians is also something that the government has uh, committed to do across a range of files and issues. As our government has indicated on numerous occasions, any major change to the way we cast our vote would require the broad support of Canadians. 
The government remains committed to strengthening and protecting our democratic institutions. We're moving to accomplish that goal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.